Hi everyone and welcome to the last video of chapter 17. Uh, this is part 3a, speciation and extinction. Now before we go into the process of speciation, which is basically the process of forming new species, we first need to define what a species is. So a species is actually a group of similar organisms with the same morphological, physiological, behavioral, biochemical features, and which can interbreed to produce fertile offspring, i.e. they are not reproductively isolated from each other. Morphological um, refers to appearances, physiological and biochemical features uh, refer to molecules and processes inside the animal, and behavioral is obviously the behavior of the animal. But most importantly of all these things is the last point here um, at the bottom, which is interbreeding. If the organisms can mate with each other and produce offspring that can produce more offspring, i.e. fertile offspring, then it's considered the same species. Okay, for example, let's look at this horse and this donkey. This horse and donkey can interbreed, can, but is it the same species? No, because the offspring result is a mule, and the mule is infertile. It is not an offspring that can produce more offspring. Therefore, horses and donkeys are not the same species. Okay, same species again can interbreed to produce fertile offspring, i.e. not reproductively isolated from each other. But in this case, the horse and donkey are reproductively isolated from each other. They cannot interbreed to produce fertile offspring. So now that we have defined species, we can now talk about speciation. Speciation, as I said just now, is the formation of a new species, and it always involves reproductive barrier between populations. What do you mean reproductive barrier? Something that separates reproduction. So there are two types. One is a pre-zygotic isolating mechanism. Zygote is like the baby, right? So pre-baby <laughs> isolating mechanism. What does that mean? This means a process that prevents fertilization, so a barrier that prevents fertilization in the first place. Or it could be a post-zygotic isolating mechanism. So it's after baby. So that's pre-zygotic and post-zygotic isolating mechanism. We will see examples of each in a moment. Okay, and uh, as a result of these two reproductive barriers, we have two types of speciation, allopatric, caused by geographical isolation, uh, and the second type of speciation is sympatric speciation, which is caused by everything else. So in the same location, but form forming a new species anyway. Okay, so let's talk about the isolating mechanisms first, and then we'll talk about the types of speciation. So starting with the pre-zygotic isolating mechanisms. Again, this is a reproductive barrier that prevents fertilization or prevents mating entirely. So some of these isolating mechanisms include Number one, geographical barriers. So populations may be separated by seas, mountain, distance, or habitat. So geographically, they don't even meet. So how would they mate? So they can't even meet. So number two, it could be temporal. Again, um, this in this situation, populations breed during different seasons or different year or different time of day. And therefore, um, they don't meet and therefore cannot mate. And an example of this is in periodical cicadas. I'll let you watch the video and I'll debrief you right after. After 17 years underground, creatures are stirring. The nymphs of the periodical cicada have been biding their time. Now they march like zombies towards the nearest tree and start to climb.
At first, there are merely thousands, but soon more than a billion swarm all over the forest. The biggest insect emergence on the planet is underway. upper branches where they climb out of their external skeletons and assume their adult winged form. At first they're white and soft, but they have until dawn to complete their transformation. After an absence of 17 years, the forest is now overrun by cicadas. The adults are clumsy and very edible. For turtles and other inhabitants of the forest, this is a feast they're lucky to see once in their lifetime, and they gorge themselves while they can. Times have never been so good. The cicadas have no defences and virtually offer themselves to their attackers. The stream of insects is so relentless that soon all the predators are full to the point of bursting. And still the cicadas come. With the predators overwhelmed, the survivors can achieve their purpose. After mating, the adults lay their eggs, and then their job is done. In just a few days, they will all die, and the forest will fall silent. The cicadas here will not be heard again for another 17 years. So, you basically just witnessed the life cycle of a periodical cicada. Um, the life cycle is 17 years, but there are other cicadas that have 13 years of life cycles. 13, 1, 3, okay? So, um, because of the difference in the length of the life cycle, which means one species emerges off the ground 17 years once, and then the other one emerges off the ground once in 13 years. So you can imagine that they never meet and therefore can never mate. So this is also an isolating mechanism. Number three, it could be behavioral. Populations may have different courtship rituals, mate calling, a mating call, I mean, and mate preference. And this makes sense because different species would respond to different um, courtship rituals or mating rituals. And this can be seen particularly in the Birds of Paradise, which I'm going to cut to a video right now.
In the great island of New Guinea, there are... So, I know it's colorful, it's crazy, it's so cute. Um, I just want to say that Birds of Paradise, it's not one bird, it's not one type of bird and one species. There are many species of bird inside the Birds of Paradise. And of course, I don't require you to memorize all your names. This is just an example. So that is the behavioral isolating mechanisms. Different species respond differently to different calls or rituals, and that would isolate species. Um, number four, it could be a morphological or physical isolating mechanism. So reproductive features don't even match, so it's impossible to mate. We are talking about reproductive structures, organs, if you may. Think of an elephant. Can it mate with a small mouse? And the answer is no, because the size cannot, okay? It just cannot. So it's impossible to fit. It's not even compatible. So yeah, these are four isolating mechanisms that are pre-zygotic. Let's go on to the post-zygotic isolating mechanisms. So in the post-zygotic isolating mechanism, this prevents development of the embryo or ability of the offspring to reproduce. This means that it does not prevent mating. So the two animals from different species can mate, maybe can even fertilize the like the gametes can fuse, but it cannot develop. Or maybe um, the offspring that has developed cannot reproduce. So there are three different things here. 
Okay, number one, it could be gamete mortality. So gametes do not survive and fertilization does not occur. Means the two animals can mate theoretically, physical act of mating can, but no fertilization occurs. Um, okay, so gametes would die inside one or the other person body, animal, whatnot. Number two, zygote mortality. So the gametes can fuse, the animals can mate, gametes can fuse, but the zygote that forms doesn't develop and it fails, in a it fails for cell division and it dies. So that's some sort of miscarriage. And number three, sterile hybrids. So this happens sometimes, rare, but sometimes. And uh, this is when the two animals of different species can mate, the gametes can fuse, so fertilization does occur. The zygote that's formed can develop into a bigger offspring, but the offspring cannot produce gametes and cannot form offspring. And this is, uh, these sterile hybrids are mostly in animals, they're not in plants. Plants are very resilient to all sorts of nonsense. Uh, we will see later on how they can produce hybrids that still are fertile. Uh, but that's an exception. Uh, generally, if the hybrid is formed and it's sterile, there will be selection against these hybrids. So the occurrence of hybrids forming is very, very rare because number one, it's a waste of the animal's energy really, because the species just wants to reproduce and survive and reproduce some more. Why reproduce to something you cannot, like, like that, that does not uh, pass down the, the alleles, okay? So for example, we talked about a mule here just now. The mule cannot reproduce and cannot pass its alleles down to its offspring. So it's just a waste of energy and space. Okay, and it might not be adapted, well adapted to its environment. It may not be like the horse or the donkey at all. I don't know what you can do. But yeah, that's the idea of a post-zygotic isolating mechanisms. The idea of these three things here. Preventing development of embryo or ability of offspring to reproduce. But do not prevent mating. So... With the isolating mechanisms out of the way, we can now talk about the type of speciation. So there are two types here, allopatric speciation. But allo means different. So this actually concerns uh, speciation that occurs as a result of a geographical barrier of a same species, aka different location. Allopatric means different location. So how is this process occurring? This is a process, you need to remember this. So number one, there's a geographical barrier. For example, a river, a mountain of sea, uh, separating two groups of the same, spe same species, just two populations. Two populations of same species. And they are physically separated, meaning that they cannot meet and they cannot mate. So they cannot breed and there is no gene flow, which means the genes don't mix or pass down to one another. Barrier prevents interbreeding between two populations. So we consider the populations to be reproductively isolated. Okay, yeah. Right, so now that the two populations are in different locations, they're the same species, but because they're in different locations, they have different selection pressures, different environmental conditions in each population that is isolated. And in each environment, the individuals with beneficial alleles for the environment is selected for and therefore are more likely to survive and reproduce even more and pass down those beneficial alleles to offspring. Now, this might sound familiar to you because this is a process of natural selection and it happens here just differently to different um, populations in different locations. 
and this results in change of allele frequency or gene pool over time. Now, besides different selection pressures occurring to those two different populations separated by a geographic barrier, uh, there are also different mutations occurring giving rise to new alleles. Okay, and this could occur differently in different um, populations. And maybe there might be some random change in allele frequency due to genetic drift in those separate populations as well. So over time, over a long, long time, many, many generations, we're not talking about one, two, we're not talking about ten generations, we're talking about hundreds and thousands of years, maybe the population will have sufficient differences okay, due to all these things genetically. And therefore, last time they were the same species, right? Beef and then they got geographically isolated. Now, even when they met again, they are unable to interbreed to produ produce fertile offspring, and therefore are really reproductively isolated. Both groups have changed just in a different way, and therefore, since they are unable to breed and produce fertile offspring, this is considered a new species. So this species A and species B might not be the same species anymore. In fact, one of them may become species C. So let's look at an example and apply our knowledge. So um, let's talk about cormorants on the Galapagos Island. And at this point now, you should already know that hey, Darwin did a lot of his work on the Galapagos Island. Well, actually, he did work all over the world, but his work on the Galapagos Islands is like the most famous. Anyways, this is a cormorant, it is a type of bird, um, and he observed that the island's cormorants are flightless. And but the cormorant species on the mainland is can fly. So so it is originated from the mainland, but it cannot fly already. And why is that? Geographical isolation. So this is isolation because of the sea. This is because of the island. So somehow that ancestral flying species reach those islands from the mainland and therefore resulting in no gene flow between those two populations. Yeah, And then um, different selection pressures acted on separate populations. So what kind of selection pressures here? Now we can see an example. On the island, there's no predators. So there's reduced predation, there's less selection pressure for efficient flight because you don't need to fly away to run away from predators. And um, there's still selection pressure for efficient movement underwater. So you want to reduce the, the, the selection pressure for efficient flight has reduced and instead the birds that were better adapted for swimming is selected for. Whereas for flight, it doesn't really matter anymore. Over time, the wings of the cormorants reduce in size. And this could be a few reasons. It could be that um, it saves the energy of the bird, maybe. So produce less wings and produce better flippers, for example. Or it's simply just not important anymore and is lost via genetic drift. So in this case, we can say that a loose Patrick speciation has occurred because this now looks very different from the species on the mainland and therefore is considered a new species. However, plot twist, um, this is current update. Recently, there are feral cats and dogs that somehow arrive on the island and the selection pressure has changed again. And maybe we'll see in a hundred years, the textbook will update itself and say, oh, actually, the cormorants now can fly again. But who knows? Um, but currently, we don't see that. We see a massive reduction in population and it's currently an endangered species. So yeah, that's allopatric speciation. Now, one more example, which is very, very famous, is Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. Um, Darwin's finches actually comprise a group of about 18 different finches uh, of different species with the same common ancestor from, again, the mainland of South America. Whoops, um, I wanted to show you the map. 
mainland of the South America here. The Galapagos Island is here. Anyways, um, so they he discovered that all these finches, okay, they each have a different beak shape and size to adapt to their environment, and they are all reproductive isolation. This means that maybe in some point, long long time ago, geographical isolation has not only happened once but several times, giving rise to many different species with different sizes of beak which adapted to different environments. So um, you can see here, for example, a long pointed beak would be great to get seeds from a cacti. So this is a cactus finch. For the wobbler finch, thin sharp beak to spear insects, like, yeah, you know, very gross. Um, and you can see here, a large ground beak would have a short heavy beak to eat large seeds found on the ground. So different, different birds here, different sizes of beak, different shape for to, to um, adapt to its different environment on different islands. It's pretty cool. So that was allopatric speciation, speciation caused by a geographical barrier. So different location, but sympatric speciation is about the same location and no physical isolation involved. So the populations, okay, the population of the same species is not physically isolated from one another, no geographical barrier, but somehow has managed to form different species. So so what's the process here? So instead of physical isolation, the population, the, the, the individuals within a population may have different features or behavior compared to other individuals in the same population. Uh, it could be other isolating mechanisms as well, but these two are the most common. And somehow this causes the populations to not interbreed and result in a barrier to gene flow. Over time, again, the idea is that genetic drift occurs or some sort of um, change in allele frequency occurs, causing the population to become reproductive isolated. And they cannot breed as they are now different species. But I need to make this very clear that there is no difference in natural selection here. Okay, not a lot because they are in the same locations and they are in the same environment. It's just that there might be different features or behavior involved. So let's let's have an example of this, and this is uh, one that's very interesting. Um, you have to know this, by the way. I'm not teaching this for fun. So let's look at polyploidy in plants. So polyploidy in plants. Um, just means that the plant has more than two sets of chromosomes. So far, you've learned haploid, which is one set of chromosomes, diploid, which is two sets of chromosomes. And anything more than two sets of chromosomes, we call it a polyploid. Or we can, of, of course, there's a specific ones like triploid, triploid, um, quarterploid, quin, quinploid. Sorry. Diploid, triploid, tetraploid, pentaploid, hexaploid, but anyway, all those that are larger than two sets of chromosomes, uh, those are all called polyploids, okay? My goodness. So what about polyploid plants? Well, they are the result of complete non-disjunction in meiosis. What is non-disjunction, you say? Non-disjunction is when chromosomes fail to segregate to opposite poles. This results in gametes with a missing or extra chromosome, or in this case, because it's a complete non-disjunction, an extra set of chromosome. Okay, let's talk about non-disjunction in general. So this is incomplete <clears throat> non-disjunction. So this one can happen in humans also, yeah? So it is when um, two chromosomes here fail to segregate. So you can see the results of the second meiosis and the gametes here, it results in N plus one, so extra one chromosome, or 
less one chromosome. This could happen also in meiosis 2, non disjunction. So instead of the chromosomes not being able to separate, this is the chromatid. Sister chromatids not being able to separate. And this also results in a gamete with an extra chromosome and a gamete with a missing chromosome. Um, and this causes an individual, okay, after fusion, to have extra or missing chromosomes as well. Imagine a normal gamete fusing with a gamete with an extra chromosome. So as a result, you have 2n plus 1. So you have diploid number normally, normal one plus one chromosome. And this results in diseases like 21, uh, 21 trisomy, trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. So three of the chromosome 21, uh, triple X syndrome called XXX, um, and so on and so forth. Man, it's not triple XXX, it's just triple X, by the way. Anyways, um, so this is just a normal non disjunction. This is the less severe one. And in humans, um, these individuals can still survive. They have the disease, but they can still survive. However, in plants, there is complete non disjunction, means all identical chromosomes fail to segregate to opposite poles. All of the homologous chromosomes fail to segregate at everything. So you realize here, because all the chromosomes fail to separate, this results in 2N gametes, diploid gametes, and gametes with nothing at all. It could happen in meiosis 2 as well, um, causing an allele, um, the sister chromatids to not segregate, and therefore a diploid number here as well. So uh, this results in diploid gametes, and therefore you can, you can imagine what kind of organisms it may result in. So 2n may be able to fuse with n, giving a triploid number, or it could 2n could fuse with 2n to produce a tetraploid 4n. And the question is, can these plants survive? Okay, in humans, definitely cannot survive. In plants, well, according to many experiments, maybe some actually can. Uh -huh. So that brings us to our idea of sympatric speciation. So in general, fusion of two mutated gametes result in new individuals with different chromosome number as parents. And therefore, this new different chromosome number, whether it's 3N or 4N, cannot interbreed with its original parent species, which is 2N. But it may be able to produce, to interbreed, to produce, you know, other organisms. This therefore is considered a new species. Of course, polyploidy, okay, this occurrence of no, complete non-disjunction is very rare, so it doesn't happen all the time. It happens sometimes, and sometimes is enough in order to make new species. So um, we're going to learn two examples of polyploid plants here. Yes, we're not done yet. These are specific examples of real life things. Number one is autopolyploids. So combination of chromosomes from the same species, what happens when two parents of the same species breed and result in a plant that is a polyploid. Or it could be combinations of chromosomes from two different but closely related species. So two different plants they are very closely related, can interbreed and produce a new species as well. Okay, so that's incredibly fascinating, isn't it? So let's talk about autopolyploid first. Again, autopolyploid is the idea that it's a combination of chromosomes from the same species. So the parent uh, is the same. Okay, so diploid parents uh, somehow have non-disjunction during non-biosis, resulting in diploid gamete. And because 2n plus 2n resulted in 4n. So this results in a tetraploid offspring. Now this is kind of hard to divide by meiosis now because four cro homologous chromosomes are present. So can you imagine four homologous chromosomes lining up so usually it's two by two by two, right, in uh, meiosis one. 
but what if you are 4n so is it 4 by 4 by 4 that's going to be quite tough so um, it cannot it's quite hard but it can grow and produce asexually by mitosis because it's a plant so it can do that but however in very rare instances meiosis can occur and successfully results in a diploid gamete now this diploid gamete here which occurs very rarely can interestingly fuse with a normal gamete from the same diploid parent can theoretically can fuse can fertilize forming a triploid gamete but however can you know can fuse can interbreed but the offspring is sterile because the triplet offspring cannot evenly segregate its chromosomes to two poles so the gametes have uneven chromosome number r and r abnormal okay, can you imagine 3 n divided by 2 is 1.5 n there's no structure as 1.5 chromosomes it's always going to be a weird number of chromosomes and the idea here is hey look what's our definition of species again species is a group of organisms that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. We see here, since the autopolyploid, which is the tetraploid offspring, since it cannot inter it can interbreed, but it's unable to form fertile offspring, this means that the diploid plant and the autotetraploid plant are considered a separate species entirely. Okay, I will repeat that again in slightly different terms. Okay, fine. The diploid parents can produce a tetraploid offspring, but the tetraploid offspring, okay, is considered separate species from the diploid parent because when it can interbreed, which is very rare, it does not produce a fertile offspring. This here is a post-zygotic isolating mechanism so this is autopolyploid how about allopolyploid so in allopolyploid okay there's two species that are breeding the parent species are different so this is species a this is closely related species b so different species but quite close lah, okay so they might be diploid okay and uh, maybe complete non-disjunction occurs again and this results in diploid gametes this also can form a tetraploid offspring but since this is an allo tetrapolyploid um, this person technically has this person i mean this plant technically has 2n plus 2n which are from different different uh parents right so it might not be identical so meiosis is slightly easier and it is probably fertile so if um the allopolyploid goes through meiosis this is considered a normal thing and will produce a diploid gamete okay whereas the diploid parent here is going through normal meiosis so when we fuse them together, do we get a triplet offspring? Yes, we do. Okay, and is it still sterile? And the answer is yes. And this also results in gametes with uneven chromosome number. This shows that okay, the diploid plant, whether A or B, cannot interbreed with the male uh, with the allopolyploid to produce fertile offspring okay so it can fuse correct it can be fertilized the offspring can develop but the offspring again is fertile is, is sterile and cannot produce more um, offspring and therefore they are considered separate species so species a is one species closely related species b is one species and the resulting allopolyploid is also considered a different species yeah so you might be thinking okay okay so this is theoretical right 
yes, it's theoretical. Is there a real life example of this? Does this actually happen in real life? And the answer is yes. <laughs> so let's look at a real life example now. Um, and it's a little bit more complicated, but I'll, I'll walk you through it, don't worry, okay? So this example is about allopolyploid plants, specifically the Spartina species. Allopolyploid means that there must be two parents, uh, both not the same species, but closely related. So this one, um, this, this uh, particular example involves Maritima and Alteniflora, Spartin both Spartina species. Um, one's from UK and one's from US. Somehow the US one made it over into the UK coastal lands and uh, they both go through meiosis and produce gametes normally. Uh, because they're in the same location, okay, these two gametes fuse and form Spartina town sandy. Spartina town sandy is sterile, hybrid, and reproduces asexually. And you might think that is weird, but it's actually not. Because on the surface, it looks like a 2N organism, a diploid organism, but hey, one, one um, set of chromosomes is inherited from Maritima, the other set of chromosomes is inherited from Alteniflora. And this means that these two sets of chromosomes are not homologous. So if it's not homologous, then how do you expect it to line up two by two by two at the metaphase plate during metaphase one? So meiosis normal ones wouldn't work. So meiosis normally wouldn't work. However, there can be non-disjunction during meiosis, okay, resulting in diploid gametes. And in this case, um, this is rare, but it happened, and in this case, it's self-fertilized and fused with each other, forming a 2N plus 2N tetraploid. Okay, and this is considered a new species, Spartina anglica. It is fertile tetraploid, okay, because it has uh, chromosomes from two parents here, two ancestors anyway, um, and they and it is actually very highly vigorous. A lot of polyploid plants tend to be very vigorous, like grows faster, grows better than their um, predecessors. Um, now, maybe you are wondering why now it's fertile, just now why sterile? Okay, just now sterile because no homeless chromosomes, right? But now it's fertile because through this event here, it actually resulted in homologous chromosomes for the for maritima and homologous chromosomes for the set of chromosomes inherited from alteniflora. So now um, it is possible for S. anglica to go through meiosis. It is possible now for the chromosomes to line up two by two by two by two at the metaphase plate during metaphase one because there is now two sets of chromosomes of each type. So again, maritima and alteniflora they're closely related, they form Hound Sandy, a hybrid, and Hound Sandy, because of this non-disjunction event, uh, self-fertilize and form Spartina anglica. These four species cannot interbreed and produce fertile offspring and are therefore deemed as completely separate species. Now bear in mind that this is still an example of sympatric speciation. And why is it considered an example of sympatric speciation? Well, that's because all of these events are happening in the same location. The plants didn't go from different place to different place. There's no geographical isolation of any sort, but there is speciation occurring. This is an example of that. So yeah, that is speciation. So far, we have learned two types of isolating mechanisms, prezygotic and postzygotic, and we have learned two types of speciation: allopatric speciation, which is caused by geographical isolation, and sympatric speciation, which is speciation in the same location. And we saw, as an example, under sympatric speciation, how polyploid plants is a thing. So with that, we are ready to move on to the next topic: extinction. So extinction, let's talk about that a little bit. In the past, there were big five mass extinction, or should I say five big mass extinctions. Uh, the most famous one you might know may be the dinosaur one. So um, many scientists think it was an ex asteroid impact or some sort of volcanic 
activity that affected a lot of species, causing 96% to go extinct. And actually, there were four previous ones before that. And this one you can read up on your own. It's not in the syllabus. But the idea is um, all these ones have been caused by natural causes. Well, sort of like the environment becoming crazy but um, or natural disasters. But the current mass extinction events might be caused, might just be caused by humans. So the question is, are we causing the six mass extinction events? And um, why do we ask this question? And the reason is because uh, we are in the age of Anthropocene. And this is the age that we have named ourselves. And this is uh, the period which human activity has been the most dominant influence on the climate and the environment. And as a result of this, one in four species are at risk of extinction. 40% of amphibians, conifers, 34% of conifers, well, you can read this diagram yourself, uh, only 25% of mammals, yet the one that we talk about most when it comes to um, conserving is mammals. But actually, the ones who need saving the most is frogs. Maybe because they're not that cute, so you know people don't want to save them as much. Anyways, um, we do need to pay attention to the environment. So, um, there is a global environmental organism out there set up in order to monitor these things. And this is also where I got this information here and this little cute chart. Uh, it's called the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And this red list that they came out with evaluates the conservation status of plant and animal species. Um, some in the species are very high profile, others are like frogs, are less photogenic and not enough publicity. So they are not, the awareness for them is not as high. And IUCN actually takes this and evaluates it as well and comes up with useful statistics for everyone to see. You can check it out at the link here that I put in my slides. Now the extinction is largely due to, as I said, dominant human activities, um, but it also could be due to increased competition from a better adapted species. Um, it could be due to habitat loss, and this is, can be because of humans, it can be because of natural disasters as well, mostly humans, uh, draining wetlands, cutting down of forests, pollution. It could be hunting, killing and poaching for sport or food or medicine. And it could be due to climate change, which it's also our fault. So we will go into extinction and conservation and things like this uh, for the next chapter. But for now, uh, let's talk about which species are most likely to be affected in the context of evolution and natural selection and whatnot. And the idea is that smaller populations are less resilient than larger populations. Why? Because smaller populations, well, there are less of them. So if you kill a few, you kill a large proportion. Secondly, the species that are most likely to be affected could be the populations with reduced genetic diversity. And um, this is true because when there is no diversity, this means that there is less likely that a few individuals can survive. Okay, for example, we have a population of blue dots here. If there's a selection pressure against blue dots, none of them can survive, they, so they're extinct. However, if there's genetic, genetic diversity so of purple, no, sorry, not orange, red, and blue dots, when there is selection pressure against blue dots, at least the yellow and red ones can survive and um, make sure the population can reproduce. So yeah, that is it actually to do with this chapter. Um, other points on extinction and conservation and things like that will be covered next chapter. So stay tuned. Um, I hope you are more educated now as a bio student. I'll see you next video. Bye-bye.